Uh, in this session, we're going to cover a few things. And we're, what I wanted to do first is kind of introduce you to what Pressbooks is and what you might be looking at when you start using it. So I'm going to share my screen and start with showing you the University of Nebraska's Pressbooks network. So any one of you should be able to visit this URL. It's pressbooks.nebraska.edu and find the landing page for your University of Nebraska Pressbooks instance. This network is shared by people at UNK, UNO, UNL, and the University of Nebraska Medical Center. If you were to log in, sign in here, it will take you to your true you Nebraska identity management tool. You enter your net ID and your password, and it will log you in and give you an account or an authorized account. So if you'd like to follow along, if you haven't already created an account, you should be able to just enter your university credentials and be given a Pressbooks account that will allow you to follow along and do some of the things that Amy will show you later. Um, the other thing that you'll notice is that every Pressbooks network looks a little bit different, but here is an example of a Pressbooks network that's run by a community that publishes open textbooks. So you can see there's a bunch of kind of features about the landing page, and then this network also features a catalog, which would be where that, you, that institution might present a bunch of their published books. So by viewing the catalog, you can see, oh wow, they've published a guide to making open textbooks with students, an open approach to scholarly reading, an anthology of Hispanic literature in Spanish, uh, a blueprint for college success, a bunch of different books that they published on their network. You could filter them by subject, you could filter them by the license, you could even sort them by, let's see the latest book or the most recent one, and it will arrange the appearance of these books it presented and then see that they've published a lot of different books. So I could roll through oh, sight reading for guitar. If anybody's looking for a summer hobby, there you go. Um, and, and that's kind of how Pressbooks would present itself. So if I went back to the first page, let's say I want to, I want to know more about the guide to making open textbooks with students. Each book on the network, so if you were to create a book, every book will have its own landing page and its own URL. So I'll take you to a book that exists on your network. Uh, let's go to Okay, so here would be the landing page of that book on the Nebraska network. So hopefully I've logged in correctly. And what you'll notice is every book has its own URL and it has a landing page. So the landing page would include things like the title, the author, a brief statement about the book. It will display the license for the book, a cover image. If you want to make the book available offline in many different formats, you can. So in this case, this book is available for download as an EPUB or a PDF or a Mobi file to read on a Kindle or lots of other file formats you might want to use. And I could download this PDF and show it to you here. This PDF is a ni nicely formatted print version of the book that I could take to my print shop or I could print and distribute kind of however I want it. So Pressbooks makes it easy to publish the book to the web and also make lots of export formats. You'll also notice that the book will display a table of contents. So this book has pretty large amount of sections and chapters. Within each section, you can have subsections or units underneath the section. And then you'll see some book information or metadata. Um, there was a question from Laden about speaking to the copyright and publication credits. Absolutely. I'll show that in just a moment. Um, let me show the reading interface first and then I'll get into the, the date. So you can enter a lot of metadata for your book. And I'll show you a bit more details about how this gets entered, but you can have title, author, contributors, editors. You can choose whichever license you feel is best for your work, whether it's all rights reserved or any of the Creative Commons licenses. If you have questions about licenses, librarians are usually a good uh, resource to help you understand what your options are and what you might want to choose. You can also indicate the publisher, the publication date. If Nebraska is issuing ISBNs or DOIs, those would be like references to refer to your book. Um, you can enter those and associate them. And that's all the stuff that appears kind of on the landing page for the book. Now we can open up the introduction and start reading the book. So you'll see Pressbooks has a nice little reading interface here. Again, I can jump to the table of contents at any point. I can also click this next button and read the next chapter and kind of move through the book this way. One example of a chapter in a book would be like this, for example. So here's a chapter that I actually helped work on. When we were at the University of Wisconsin, I worked with a vernacular architecture professor to do a, an open course all about the buildings of Frank Lloyd Wright in Madison, because he has a number of buildings here in Madison. So here's a chapter. You can see there's an image with the caption. There's a, a, a link. There's footnotes. And as you hover over, you see what the footnote content is. Or you can click a footnote and it will take you down to the bottom of the book and you can read the, 
the footnote content, and then jump back up to the content here. You can see this is what's called a glossary term. If you click on the glossary term, a definition will pop up, and you can add definitions or define key terms for learners. You can put various text boxes in the book. So here's an examples text box. We've embedded a video from YouTube about Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings. Um, later down in the book, you have a text box that has some examples. Again, down at the bottom of the text box, there's another text box with some key takeaways. And finally, the other really nice feature that we built in is uh, an annotation tool that lets people discuss the work and, dis and have like either public or private conversations, discussion on the text, using a tool called Hypothesis. So here you'll see there's some highlighted text. If I click on the highlighted text, you'll notice this annotation layer pops out. And you can see that someone has made an annotation with a link to some more references, and people have replied to this annotation, and they put an image or a video in the annotation layer. So you can use this to have conversations about a text, you could use it for editorial review, or you could even use it, you could set up a little private group for your students and have a conversation only for students in your class. And so they could have like a discussion forum 2.0 on the text. That's a little bit of like what's possible and imagining what you can do with Pressbooks. Now I think there was a question from Ladon about how, or how you could create copyright and publication credits. So this is the, the front end, the reading interface for Pressbooks. But if I were a book author, I could click the admin button and it will show me this big dashboard here for a book. Amy's going to show you more detail about how to make a book, but I wanted to show you the book info piece. So before, just as a reminder, this is the book info page and there's a bunch of information about the book. All of the information that displays on this page, including book information and metadata, gets entered in the dashboard in a section called book info. So if you want to change what appears on your book's homepage, once you have a book, you just start filling out these fields. Most of them will be self-explanatory. It'll say, what's the title of my book? I can give it a short title. I can give it a subtitle. And then I can start giving people credit for what they've done in the book. If, for example, I wanted to give someone credit here for this book, I could say, let's make a new contributor. And I'll say, Julie Gregg. And I'll say, Don Ray. So I've created three new contributors for this book. I, I didn't add them as users to the book. I just created them as people that I can give credit for. So now I can come back into book info and I can say the uh, translator of this book was Julie and Don was a reviewer and I'll say Ladan was the editor and I'll save that book information. Now you'll notice that if I go to the home page of the book and come down to the bottom where I have my metadata, you'll see Ladan's being credited as the editor, Julie's being credited as the translator, and Don's being credited as the reviewer. I can add lots of other information about a book, a publisher, the publisher city, the publication date, the ISBNs, the language the book is in. So if, the book, if, this, if this book was written, say, in Spanish, I could come and select Spanish as the book language. And then all the metadata and the reading interface would generally change to Spanish as well. I could upload a cover image, which you saw on the title page. I could give the book a subject heading if I wanted to. I can also enter copyright information. So Laden was asking about this. I could give the copyright year. I list who the copyright holder is. And then I can choose what license I want to apply to this book. So by default, the book will be all rights reserved. But in, often in open education, you're going to want to choose an open license that permits people to remix and reuse. And so you can choose from any of these Creative Commons licenses. My favorite license personally is the, the CCBY license, which requires people to give attribution, but otherwise gives them the freedom to do lots of important educational things. But you may pick a different license or you might prefer something else. So you can choose to license your work here. You can also add a copyright notice. In this particular book, they added a big notice that let, tells them what the copyright statement is and gives them some instructions for how to give attribution if they wanted to. And then you can add other stuff like a tagline or a short description or a long description, as well as lots of other metadata type information. So that's the page where you can enter that.
and we have a Pressbooks guide that will give you more instructions for entering book info and configuring it to look the way you want it to look. I'm going to pause there and say uh, I have a question in the chat. Um, could we stop and take a question for why would someone want to create a press book? What are the advantages of press books over conventional books with publishers like, say, Roman and Littlefield? Okay, that's a great question, Karen. Um, I think the major, the major thing that I would say, the reason why you'd probably want to create a book with press books is that this is a publishing interface that gives you total control. So uh, in, this, in this situation, this instance, you can write, publish, and create kind of whatever you want, however you'd like to do it, and you can share it under your own terms. So it can be free for learners and free for others who might want to access this. The biggest reason I think that people are drawn to Pressbooks is because they realize that the cost of textbooks is re really, really high for their students, and they themselves are often content experts who've written the textbook, and they want a better way to do that. So that's generally the reason that you'd want to use Pressbooks to share information more freely and under the terms that you want them to be shared under. And we do a lot of the stuff that a publisher would do or make it easy for you to do the things a publisher would do, like make the book available on the web, make the available book available in lots of the different formats offline without having to know a programming language or without having to know how to use InDesign or without having to know how to use specialized publishing software. Can I interject here just a second? Yeah, go ahead, Don. With the OER programs that are uh, popping up on all of our different campuses, this is perfect for that. So you can add all that material that's out there that's available free or um, with a very small charge, uh, which I assume we're not going to be doing. Um, and you can add all that material to the book. And I'm sure that Steele is going to be talking about this later. You can actually link it into your Canvas course. And I also think that some, as someone who just graduated from a very, very large institution and have, have, just, being a have just been a student, I think um, this is especially valid, say, like, there are so many OER resources, resources these days for, say, like, introductory calculus courses. For, what, like, 2,000 students per year? What, and there, I've seen so many OERs related to, like, first-year calculus courses. And what profs can do is they can clone the book, which I'll show you how to do, or they can copy over parts they like and revise and remix and redistribute it to their students. So the students don't have to pay for second edition. They can't, if, if a first edition that's in print is no longer being used, then used books don't even count because students will need that specific resource. Whereas if you're constantly editing and revising and updating and it's as simple as a click of save, which will allow the public book that has been changed to be shown online, then no one needs to spend a single cent on it. It'll have automatically been revised by the professor and professors can alter little things to suit their students and their institution. Thanks, Andrew. That's really impassioned. I appreciate that. I was going to say that the, another big advantage would just be the, the ability that you would have as an instructor to personalize, to customize, to adapt the material for your learning context. So you know your learners very well. And I know when I, so I used to teach English literature classes and there'd be like a text or a chapter that I'd like, except for a couple of things about it. And I'd be like, all right, so I made a handout or I have this other thing, like ignore what this book says and use this in, in its place. And I always wanted to be able to adapt and revise things, but with a copyrighted uh, textbook, that was difficult. So you had to kind of come up with creative in-classroom solutions. The idea with with Pressbooks is that you can, you have the power and the, the ability to modify and adapt and revise uh, and personalize or localize it for your learners as, as needed. Um, that was what I wanted to show for book info. I think Amy's gonna show you now like how you can actually get started by making from scratch uh, a book or cloning an existing book and adapting it. So take it away, Amy. I think you should have permission to screen share. Perfect. Don, did you have something to say? I was just gonna say that I have one faculty member I think that is attending that wants to have their students start creating books as well. And that's possible. Yes, that is definitely possible. I will get into that now. I'm so excited, everyone's so enthusiastic. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, so this is what you will see when you uh, enter Pressbooks. When you log in, this is the first thing you're gonna see. And you're gonna see this big create a new book sign. But you can also go into here and 
press create a new book and once your books once you have a lot of books in your cat uh, once you've produced a lot of books or you're contributing to a lot of books all of your books will show up underneath like in a list so i'm just going to create a new book and you will always see this page so uh, you have to follow adhere to these rules so i'm just gonna uh, create a very boring name and say nebraska oops test okay and my book title will be nebraska test book perfect so for for now i don't want my book to be visible to the public because there's going to be absolutely nothing in it so now i create this book okay perfect so now we're at this book and if you go to visit book you will see that you see exactly the book uh, sort of format that Steele had just showed you in a populated book. So your books on the web will always look like this. And obviously when you populate it, then all the populated parts will show up in each respective section. So now I'm gonna go into, back into admin and this is where we were before. Now that you've created your book, say you wanna add students or other contributors, I can take you to users. And this is where you will be adding the people who will be a part of the book. So let's say I have made this book and I just want to share it with Don. Then I would go to add new and I would add him either as, as a new user or as an existing user. So an existing user would be someone who is already, has already logged into the Nebraska network and has access to the stuff that, to the Nebraska network or has contributed in some way. So they would either have to sign in or sign up. Um, or if they already are, or if they haven't logged in, sorry, or if they've never been on the network, then I can add them as a new user. Um, say you want to add all 50 students to this one book because you want them to collaborate. Then we can go to bulk add and you can individually type in all of their emails so that you don't have to set up a new user and click 50 times. You can add all of their emails and add user and all of them will get an email invitation. The one thing I will note is that role is important because this will decide how much access they have to the back end of the book. So if you want your students to write books, um, write a book, sorry, or contribute to the book, I would suggest you choose them as either as author or editor. Um, and if you have other professors working with you or other instructors working with you or TAs, et cetera, then you can set them as admin and they will have um, more liberties with the book. Um, lastly, as a setup measure, I want to show you this. So right now the book is set as private, which means that when I go to visit my book, if I log out, then I can't see the book anymore. Um, but now if I log back in, because I am me and I am the administrator of this book, I have access to this book. So what happens if I set this book to public now, even though I'm signed out now, I'm able to see the book because I've set the book to public. So that's something that you have to be a little bit careful about, which is why I recommended when we first set up the book that you set your book to private. Um, I'm gonna keep this one open because it doesn't matter. No one's gonna look at this book, hopefully. <laughs> um, so those are some of the privacy settings. Um, you can also alternatively choose to, say you want to hide a certain chapter, you can also have the book require a password and you can set your own password so that if I set a password, if I access the chapter, it's going to ask you to type in the password. And that way, if you only want chapters to be seen by certain people, then you're able to set up. Now that we have the book setting sort of out of the way, I can show you how we can create a book. So in my mind, what makes Pressbooks so great is, um, uh, the fact that there's different ways that you can start a book. So either you start from the bottom up. So there's a completely empty book. You can start creating the book. You can start writing in the book. You can build everything from the ground up as you would do with a normal book. But in my opinion, the beauty of OER is that you can, you can remix and revise. So there's three ways, in my opinion, this is how I'm going to break it down to create a book. There's a bottom up, there's a top down, and then there's mashing everything in together. So the bottom up part right now would be to create um, a book. So I can add a chapter and I can say uh, test chapter. This is the first new chapter. So this is how I would start writing in a book, right? And if I wanted multiple different parts, if I did, if I wanted multiple different sections, I can add a new part and this says second main. I meant to say second main body, but it automatically saved. Um, and now when I go back here, now I have a second part and I can start adding chapters in here as well. And you can have as many chapters and as, ma and as many parts as you want. 
Um, so that's how you would start building from the ground up. And you can write whatever you want in them. And I'll show you what you can write inside afterwards. I see there's some questions in the chat. Steel, I'll let you take care of them for now. Unless, actually, I'll look at them. I got it, Amy. Yes, I will. Stephanie, I will be explaining that in a little bit. So now there is now I'll take you through how you can mash different parts in together. Um, and this is done with the import function. So if you go to tools and import, you're able to import a lot of different content files into Pressbooks. Um, unfortunately, Stephanie, a PDF is not one that you can do, but it takes most other files and it shows you what it can take here. So in other openly licensed textbooks, as I see here um, from our friends at Rebus community, you're able to download different functions and I'll show you how you can do this as well, but you can choose to make your book available to others. And in this case, because Rebus community is a open, uh, open educational community, um, they want to make things as accessible as possible. So in this case, I'm gonna download Pressbooks XML, which is a file format that we do take. And I'm going to choose XML, choose a file, and I'm gonna choose XML. And now I'm gonna import the contents of this, of the Rebus publishing guide into my book. But I don't, if I wanted to import the whole book, I could choose this, but I don't want to import the whole book. Say I just want licensing information. But their licensing information was in their back end, but I don't want it in my back end. I want it in my front end. So I'm going to import that into here. And I've only chosen this one. So now when I've imported, oops, why is it not working? There you go. So now you can see my licensing information is in my front matter, even though their licensing information is in their back matter. So that gives you a lot of flexibility as to what you can do. Now next, I can also show you a case in which I can bring this in through, let's say, um, sorry, let's say the book doesn't have a downloading function. So this book, the authors of this book decided that they don't want this book downloaded for, for the public to see, the public to have rather. So I can copy and paste this and import from URL and I can begin import. And similarly, I will see all the parts of the book and I can decide what I want to transfer over. So let's take lost and found and we're total pro, even though I'm definitely not. And let's say I want to keep them as chapters. I can import selection. And now you might be wondering where are, I created two parts and there's different parts where the chapters can go. What am I gonna do now? I'm building two a mediocre suspense here. Okay, now it's done. <laughs> and you can see it came into the main part, the main body. But the beautiful part is that now you can just drag. <laughs> so I didn't want those two. I wanted to be able to differentiate between what I brought in versus what I wrote myself. So I can have these features just by, I can read just, I can, uh, choose where I want the chapters to go in the book, but so I can also have licensing information ahead of information. So you have a lot of flexibility and ordering the books without having to go through a huge maneuver. You won't have to copy and paste and re-uphaul your whole book for this. One thing I will mention is that you can't transfer between parts, um, but there's, the book is really divided into three sections. So it's front matter, middle matter, middle section, and back matter. Um, front matter can only stay in front matter, middle section can only stay in middle section, and back matter can only stay in back matter. So that's something to keep in mind. But within, within, within these parts, you can uh, choose where they go. So that is how I would describe mishmashing different OER resources into one book. And now I'll go through the top-down method. So the top-down method is cloning a book. And let's say you're really pleased with this one textbook that's stellar, but you want to make a few adjustments or you want to remove a chapter or two. But instead of importing, what you can do is go to an openly licensed book. In this case, I've taken Open Text BC's book. And if I come here, now I can clone a book. So this book is coming from Open Text BC. And I'm going to say, my, I want this to be prov provincial BC English. Okay, and my target book title is provincial. <laughs> or you can leave a blank and it'll bring over whatever book title that um, uh, Open Campus was using. 
So cloning takes a little bit, obviously, because our API is taking a lot of time to drag every piece of information from this website in live time. Um, in the meantime, uh, what I'd like to say is you can only clone a book if it has a certain license. So for example, you will not be able to clone a book if the book license is all rights reserved um, for obvious reasons. Um, but in this case, this book did not. It has the normal CCBY attribution, which gives you a lot of flexibility to distribute the book in any way you'd like. Amy, just real fast, there is a conversation happening in the chat, mm -hmm. and it's kind of nuanced, so maybe I'll take a second and answer some of those questions. So Do there you was need a screen question. Share? No, I don't need the screen share, I'll just talk, I think. Um, okay, great. They can watch the, the, the clone turn on. Um, <laughs> the, the question was about, um, could you include an entire article that had been published elsewhere, like an open access journal? So it is a question about copyright, and for copyright questions, it is good to consult with a copyright expert at your institution. It's probably gonna be a librarian. Uh, uh, but generally, it depends on the license of the original material. If it's all rights reserved, but open access, then you don't have the right without permission to redistribute that material in your book. Um, so you could link to it, but you couldn't make a copy and revise and edit it. You could, however, probably, depending on what your university's stance on uh, fair use is, I think that you could make a fair use argument. Yes, I can bring that into a book as long as I don't publish it openly to the web. I could put it in a in the book, leave it private, and only share it via two students through the LMS, which is the same argument that people often make when you take a PDF of an article or of a, a book that you've scanned a chapter of and you bring it into your LMS as a course reading, that's a fair use for educational purposes as long as it's only available to a limited number of students in your class for a limited time. There's a kind of established case law on that. If, however, the article was published in that journal, not just open access, but with an open license, like a Creative Commons license that allows people to revise and redistribute, then yes, you absolutely could. And so the examples that Amy are showing are with material that do have those open licenses. And so you do already, you have already been granted the permission to clone it, to bring it into your book, to do whatever you want with it. And that's what we think is really exciting in the educational space. And that's why open licenses are just so valuable for instructors because they give you the permission to do the kinds of things you're asking about. Um, and so Greg's question is, uh, uh, thanks for the content presentation. As we get started with creating a book and have more detailed questions, can you email either of us? So the, the way that it works at Nebraska is you have a network, you have network managers that are going to be the lead Pressbooks people at your campuses. So Don is on this call and Brad is on this call and Julie's on this call. I can't remember who the fourth one is. It Mike Zimmerman maybe? I don't remember. But each campus will have at least one person who will be your first line of support. That's the person that you would want to email. And then those network managers, if they can't answer your question, they will come to us with questions. And so we provide the premium support to the, your network managers. And we're, we're more than happy to answer questions there. Also, okay. if you have questions and you can't remember the person, if you know somebody from any of the campuses, you can relay the questions to us and we'll get those answers to you too. Let's continue with the demo. Um, so now the book has finally been cloned. You will see if I go on Visit website, it's cloned over. It looks literally identical to this book. <laughs> so that's pretty nice, isn't it? And then everything else looks the same as well. And you can see all the metadata has copied over as well. So that is how you clone a book. And now I will show you the fun part, which is writing the book. So I have gone back to my test book, which is completely empty. But I thought it'd be nice if I could show you <laughs> how to in an empty book rather than a populated book. So if I go into my chapter, this is what's called our visual editor. And you have a text editor if you know HTML. This might be very useful for you. I personally am working on it, <laughs> but I don't know HTML. And, this, it, and what's so nice about the visual editor is that um, it's set up in the exact same way that, say, uh, Google Docs or Word is set up. So it's convenient for almost anyone to use. Um, so let's start writing. Um, the first place I'd say that we should start is perhaps this feature here, which are the headers. Um, I would recommend while you're writing your book to start from header one, header two, and not really skip them because it orders the book in certain, uh, the book is formatted in a certain way where it's designed to support each heading in a uh, 
in a structured sort of a way. So one, two, three, obviously. So if I start with heading one, I'll say this is a header. And if you go in here now, you'll see that it's H1. So it corresponds properly. It, it corresponds as it should to each other. So that's the heading function. And then something, that, something else that you might wanna do is add a text box. So there's many different examples of a text box. You can have an exercise. Oh, whoops. They're all essentially the same basically, but that is not what I meant to do. I just added a text box within a text box. Um, but there's many different colors and you can choose, but they're all formatted so that if you choose exercise, you'll get blue. And if you choose learning objectives, you'll get green. There's different ways you can change the colors of these. They're also customizable, so you're not stuck with them. The text boxes are useful because lots of profs or instructors at the end of their chapter, they will add learning objectives um, interspersed throughout their chapter. And then at the end, they'll have a big exercise portion with different questions and other activities in it, like H5P, which Seal can show you later. So there's that. And another useful feature is a table. So you can create a table to whichever size to your liking. There's different cells. Um, that might be useful for your course. And then what's nice, what's so nice about this is you can also add math and it just takes a simple LaTeX short code. So if I just take Pythagoras. And then I just have to end my short code. So let's take a second. And if I save and view my chapter, nice. Now it's formatted and it looks nice and doesn't have the short codes around it. It's a nice little image. And you're able to add these wherever you want. You can add them in text boxes, etc. So if I go back, am I going too quickly? Does anyone have any questions about what they can add? I see there's a lot of questions in chat. Um, are there any directly related to this right now? Nope, keep going, Amy. Okay, excellent. So that's LaTeX. And then the two other things that I wanna show you that are important are footnotes and glossary. So I'm not gonna go through all the other ones. There's special characters, which has an incredible base of <laughs> just characters that you might find useful. There's a clear formatting tool. Say you've imported something, you've imported something and um, the formatting's a little wonky. What you can do is select the parts that you think are acting wonky and click clear formatting. They're all pretty self-explanatory, obviously the alignments, superscript subscript, et cetera. But Fino and Glossary are fun. So let's do this. Uh, main body, I click Glossary, then I can see the term is main body and I can say, this is a test. I'm sorry, this is very boring. <laughs> I'm not creating very many fun uh, terms, but this is the Glossary term and you can see there's a short code which shows you that this has been created into a Glossary and now it's in a, like a Glossary world where the definition of this exists. For footnotes, I don't recommend you highlight anything at all. You just have to drop a cursor and say, you can't see it now, I don't think, but I have a pop-up on my screen, which allows me to add in my footnote content. So I've just typed in, this is my footnote, and I click OK, and you can see, you know, there's a footnote there. If I save and go into my chapter, now I have my glossary, which tells me my terms, and I have my footnote, which upon clicking, it'll take me directly to my footnote. And if I click this, it'll take me back to where the footnote came from, which is convenient if students wanna see where they're, uh, the citations and they constantly have to go back and forth. So, that's, so those are the basic functionalities of what you can write in, our, um, in the chapters and in any part for that matter. And, there's a bunch of embedded media that you can use as well. So say I want to take a open licensed book and I really like the cello. So I'm gonna look up a picture of cello on the Creative Commons uh, search base. And the person says credit, credit the creator and non-commercial uses only. This is not a commercial use. So for now it isn't, I suppose. The textbook rather. So I'm gonna save this as a JPEG. And if I come into here, there's this nice button that says add media. I can click add media and select a file. 
And now I can add an alt text. So the alt text is what shows if the page isn't rendering. So say your image isn't rendering for some odd reason, I'm going to say uh, cello on a white couch. I know that's not the proper terminology for that piece of furniture. I have no idea what it's called. Um, and I'm going to say, um, and that's the caption that'll show up underneath my picture. And if you ever want to replace your media, you're able to do so. And I'll show you a little bit later onwards. This is not the only way that you can add your media, um, but there's a separate media gallery function and there's a bunch of attributions. So I would take, I would go find this image. I would add the source URL. I would add his name, Tom K. Cello. And you can see there's a lot of different, uh, you can find all the information that you would need on here. And the, the license was, I believe it was non-commercial, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to be distributing this book anywhere. So for time's sake, I am not going to fill all of that in. But there we go. Now we have a picture and the caption that I added. Another thing you can do is add a YouTube video, which I can just copy and paste into here. We've gotten questions before on whether or not this is allowed. And you can do this because it's just embedding the video from somewhere in a, from a public domain. If you were to download the book and upload, uh, upload this as your own video, that is a whole other story. I would advise against it unless the content was openly licensed and you credit it properly, but to just embed a YouTube video is okay. And you can see that uh, if you were to click this in the browser, it would automatically start playing, which is nice so that you don't, it doesn't take you outside of your page. It won't take you to a separate YouTube uh, tab, sorry. It will automatically start playing in the browser. So those are two ways in which you can add media. And if I click save, if I go into my chapter, you can see it looks nice. And if I start playing this, it will start playing on my browser, which is awesome. Uh, the one thing to note here is that these features, this, the video will only show in the book in the web book version, obviously, if you were to export this as a PDF, which I will show you in a bit, um, it will have a little video box that says this video will not play here because this is a print copy. <laughs> um, but I will show you that when we come across it. Also, what's really nice about these things is that you can also put them in text boxes. So if you want a picture to go along with uh, a description or a learning exercise, then you're able to put them in there and same with YouTube videos as well. So moving on, this, the picture that you've added all lives in this nice thing called a media library. So you can either choose to add uh, your media library, you can, add, you can choose to add your pictures into here, um, at which point if you were to go on your chapter, you will automatically have access to them, or you can add them in, as you're going along, as you're writing your book in the chapters themselves, but you'll have to upload them then. I hope that makes sense. It's just like, copying and pasting a picture into Word as opposed to importing something that already exists in your laptop, let's say. So that's our media library. Okay, now we're basically done. That is how you construct a book. So, so let's say that I've spent hours and hours and hours on this and now my book looks perfect and I'm ready to show this to, my, to the world, which is definitely not true right now. So all I have to do is go to export. Amy, before you export, would you just show the appearance thing where you can choose a different theme? So, so they see that? Uh, the theme options? Yeah. Yeah, so the themes are, there's many themes that you can use. Obviously, we have a lot here. And the themes affect all of uh, the web books, the ebooks, the Mobi files, the uh, PDF. And it just affects the way that um, our books look. And they've been custom designed so that they fit a specific function. So for example, if you're writing a textbook, um, most people I would say use either the, uh, the Graham theme, the Jacobs theme, or Malala. Malala is our newest one. I really like the way it looks. Um, I studied chemistry and I studied math and uh, most of my textbooks came with like a very clean, nice looking layout and I really recommend Malala. So if I activate Malala, I can now visit my book and Although it doesn't look any different on here when you click on the chapters, it looks slightly different. Like the text is different, the colors are different, the font is different. Um, 
the learning objective colors will stay the same, but like I said, that's customizable regardless, um, if I remember how to do that. Steel. <laughs> it's, under, it it's in global options, so if you go to global options, just there under theme options. Perfect, yes. And scroll down, you'll see nice. here are the colors you can change globally for each one of those text boxes. So if I want this to be a god-awful shade of pink, <laughs> Um, I can now have this, and if I go into my book, it should have changed to pink. Oops. There we go. Now, now it is this awful, awful shade of hot pink and kind of light to army green. So you can obviously customize those features as well. And the one nice thing that I need to mention is the fact that you can change your theme at any time, and the book will just automatically render. And that's the nice part about Pressbooks is that at no given point, you have to decide on something, right? Isn't that like the beauty of OER? It's nothing is set. So if you like have a typo, it's not the end of the world. All you have to do is go and change it and save. And that includes our themes, color options, and whatever other customizable feature there is. The only thing that really, in my opinion, can't be changed that will be very important to you is the link of your book. Even your title, you can change if you want to. Your the book edition, you can just update them as you go. Um, but the link is really the only thing that can't be changed. So that's really nice. So now if I come into export, I'm really pleased with the Malala theme. And now you can also see that the Malala theme is here so that before you export, you know exactly what you're up for or what you signed up for. So right now I just want it for PDF digital distribution and I'm going to export it. And while I'm doing that, I will explain all the other formats as well. So let's say um, you want to add this into your LMS. This is where this is where you'd be able to see this carbon cartridges. Or someone wants to read this on a Kindle, you can also export it for that purpose as well. Can your physical copies do that? I don't think so. <laughs> um, so this is how my book looks. And what's so nice about the digital copy of the PDF is that you can click at any point and it'll take you directly there. And as you can see, it's following the Malala theme, as I had said, because it follows all the different formats. And you can see the footnote and you can see, as I had said, the video. Um, this YouTube element has been excluded from this version of the text. You can do it online here and you'd be able, to, if I click this, it would directly take me to my book. So these are the ways in which you'd be able to see your book. And the only thing that's different about the digital PDF and the print PDF is that they're not hyperlinked. So that there's a difference there. And say you want, now that you've exported your book, say you want this to now show up as downloadable features in your homepage. You'd have to go to your settings and click sharing and privacy. And at the bottom it says share latest export files. Yes, I would like to do that. So if I now visit my book, I'm able to download this book as a digital PDF. So whichever, whichever of the latest files you've exported will show up down here. So let's say I go to admin and I go to export and I did all of these. And hell, why not throw out an XML version in there for those who want to download and put it on their own instance of uh, Pressbooks or whatever other learning resource they're building on. That sentence didn't really make sense, but I hope every, I hope that made sense <laughs> in general. We're having a heat wave in Montreal right now, and it is absurdly hot. Thanks, Amy. Um, do you mind if I grab screen share from you here? Or do you yes. Want to like so okay. I just wanted to show the fact that now if you go into here and you visit the book, now all of these other functions are available for anyone to download as long as your book is public. So that's it from me. Thanks for bearing with me. Okay, um, so the couple of questions just came in the chat and I want to address both of those. So um, earlier someone was asking about a global spell check being built into Pressbooks. We haven't built global spell check into Pressbooks, but what we do know is there are a bunch of people that use a pretty popular free browser extension called Grammarly that will do the spell checking there in the browser with the editor. Or you can do spell checking by writing your document in a word processor somewhere else spell check it and then import it or copy paste it. Um, the other question that people had was how to do things with the learning management system or with Canvas. 
So let me share my screen and show you this. Um, I also mentioned earlier that you could use Hypothesis as the annotation tool. I just wanted to show you how you could turn that on for your book. If you'd like to use Hypothesis, it's a free open source tool that can be just built into your book without having to install anything. To start using it, if you come to book settings and click Hypothesis, you'll see a bunch of different options. And really what you need to do is decide which part of your book do you want it to be used on. In my case, I'll say, let's put it on parts, chapters, front matter, and back matter, and then save changes. Once I do that, when I visit this book and I go to any part of the book now, you'll see this little tool has just appeared in my browser. And when I select text, it'll give me a little prompt that says, do you want to annotate or highlight? And if I do, the Hypothesis client will pop up and it will ask me to log in with my free Hypothesis account and then I can start making annotations. You do not need a Hypothesis account to view annotations, but you would need one to create them and save them on a book. So that's how to turn Hypothesis on. The next question was, let's say I have this book. So this is a really great book. Uh, it's an introduction to women, gender, and sexuality studies. And I want to bring this book, the whole thing, into Canvas, into the learning management system. So Amy was showing the export routines earlier. One of the export options is called common cartridge with LTI links. And so I will export it in this format. And what this is, is it's a zip file that lets me bring in links to an entire book very quickly into the LMS. So I've created that LTI common cartridge file and I'm gonna download it. And then I'm going to come over to a Canvas course. So here's an empty Canvas course. I will say settings. I will say import course content. And then I'm going to pick this common cartridge file that I just downloaded from Pressbooks. I can pick only certain chapters, but at this time I'm just going to say, let's bring in the whole book in. And I'm going to click import. So what's happening now is Canvas is saying, okay, we found a file. We're going to import it into the learning management system. It's told me that it completed. And now I, I went from having an empty course to now having a very large course where every part of the Pressbooks book is now a module in Canvas and every individual chapter is now a link in Canvas. So for example, let's read about the family. When I click the link, this is loading via LTI and I am seeing the live version of the Pressbooks book here in the learning management system complete with annotation or whatever else I may want to do. If I notice there was a typo in the chapter of the family, I can come back to the book itself. Let's find the family and let's add a new sentence saying, this is for the demo at Nebraska. I changed that chapter. It's just been published. And now if I refresh this link in Canvas, you'll see the learner would see, the next time they click the link, they would see whatever the live version of the book is. So rather than loading a package that you have to re-edit and re-import, this link will be good for basically as long as you want it to be, and it will always point to the live version of your book. What's really nice about the LTI link, the question that I think uh, Professor Sashadri asked was, can you use private content? Yeah, you can. So in this case, I could say this book, this chapter, the family, is actually all, all rights reserved material that I don't want to put on the public web. So I'm taking it off of the public web, which means that if I were to view this book at the regular URL, I wouldn't see this unless I was logged in. But it will still be visible to students because the LTI link will give them the ability to view private content. So it's a way to make sure that they can see content uh, only inside the bounds of your classroom or within the walls of your class. So yes, if you wanted to use all, all rights reserved material or make material so it's only visible to your students, that would be the mechanism or the way to do that. Um, there is obviously much more that we could talk about. This was kind of drinking out of a fire hose. We went very, very fast. Um, we're at time. We really do appreciate you all being here, giving us your time and your attention. It's really inspiring to see so many instructors uh, thinking about their students and thinking about learning, especially now that your, I believe your semester's over. So you could be doing many other things right now. And it, it's really heartwarming to see you thinking about teaching and learning and thinking about how to serve your students. So thanks for taking your time today to talk with us. Um, Amy and I are more than happy to stay a little bit longer. Um, I know that we scheduled this for an hour and a half, but we are, want to be mindful of people's time. We're happy to answer any other 
questions that people have or things that they'd like to know about or to dive a bit deeper into things like interactive content. We didn't even touch on that uh, or anything else you might want to, to see. Hey, Steele, I'm going to, I'm going to pop in a, a link to the chat right now. This is for a canvas um, course we have called Pressbooks 101. Just a lot of good info. We've actually, a lot of it's links out to Pressbooks trading that's already out there. That's really good and extensive. So um, if you want to look at that, go ahead. If you see anything in there that isn't there that you'd like, let me know and we'll get it added. Um, okay. Nita said they want to see how to in interact, in insert interactive material into a book. Okay. This is probably my other favorite piece of Pressbooks. So I'm glad you asked and um, we didn't show it earlier, but let me get back to a browser that I can show this in. <laughs> can one insert animated GIFs? Of course you can. Yeah, go nuts. <laughs> um, you could do that just through the media library that Amy was showing there. You can insert GIFs and other kinds of uh, interactive or like multimedia that way. The, the, the thing that I want to show though is uh, on the Nebraska network, the most common way to make interactive content here in Pressbooks is using another third-party tool that we've integrated really tightly with Pressbooks. And that tool is called H5P. H5P was, is an open source product that is, was built as a replacement for Flash activities to do interactive learning. So it does things like quizzes, it does interactive videos, it does branching scenarios. So it does things like Captivate and Storyline and really high-powered tools, except that it's free and open source and it's tightly integrated with Pressbooks. So in a sample book, so let's say I come to this book that I have that's called Empty Book. If I hadn't previously activated it, I could come to Plugins and I would activate H5P. Once H5P is activated in your book, you'll see a little, a new link in your dashboard that says H5P content, and you can create H5P activities. So what you'll see is there are 40 something different types of interactive content. You can build accordions, essay, prompt activities, math quizzes, charts, collages, course presentations, which are like interactive PowerPoints. I mean, there's really a rich set of interactive content. In this case, let's start with something kind of simple. Let's just do a multiple choice question. So I'm gonna say, let's use the multiple choice activity type. It'll take me a second to install it the first time I wanna use it, and then I'll say use. And then what will happen is H5P will bring you to a little builder. With each of these activity types, they'll have a tutorial and an example. So the tutorial will show you step-by-step step how to make this type of activity and guide you through the first time. Usually you'll find this is pretty fast and there's a lot of options. Or you can say, here's an already existing activity that someone's already built. And you can click the reuse button and just grab that activity and modify it. So rather than making a new one, what I'm actually gonna do is come back to add new and I'm gonna say upload and add the activity that I just, oops, add the activity I just downloaded, um, which was a multiple choice activity. So let's say, let's use this activity. Just like with Pressbooks, H5P is designed to be open and licensed and to be reusable and remixable. So most H5P activities can be just imported and edited and modified, which is great because they're open. If you clone a book that has H5P activities, those activities will also be included with the clone, which is also very nice. So here I have this multiple choice question that they built. So I'm just gonna save the one that existed. And you'll notice at the bottom, there's a bunch of different options that I have where I can give students individual hints or feedback based on the answer that they selected and indicate whether an answer is correct or incorrect. I can also give overall feedback for the activity itself based on feedback range. And I can set some behavioral settings. I can let them retry this as many times as they want. I can show them the solution so that they can see it before they repractice or turn that off. I can also choose how the activity is assessed or graded and I can randomize the, the answers. And there's a bunch of different kind of detailed configuration settings here. I could also override the default text and I can localize it to another language if you're working in a target language that isn't English. We did this a lot with Portuguese when we were building a Portuguese language textbook and we really enjoyed the experience. Okay, so here is a sample multiple choice. Uh, yeah, Amy, nice job. Uh, answered a question for me in chat that I didn't know the answer to. <laughs> um, so the multiple choice activity here, you'll see this was the activity that was created. And I could say, what color does the black currant berry actual have? Let's try very dark purple. That was the right answer. So I built an interactive activity. 
once I've built one activity, I can come back to my book and I can insert it anywhere I want in the book. Just like Amy showed you the Add Media button, there'll be an Add H5P button. And let's insert this H5P activity. When I preview that chapter, you'll see here is that interactive content has just been inserted into this book and learners can interact with it. Uh, I got that one wrong. Let's show the solution. Oh, it was actually very dark purple. Let's retry it. Now it's very dark purple. That's correct. Um, there are lots of different books that have really cool examples of how people have added a bunch of different uh, interactive content to enhance their book. One of my favorite examples is the OER source book that we built at the University of Wisconsin. My graduate assistant at the time, Naomi Salmon, built this as a whole bunch of ideas for how to do interactive learning in an open book. So we talked a lot about language instruction. So you can see, here's an example of a mark the words activity where you practice conjugating a verb. So let's ch click all the words that we think are the conjugated forms of the verb ser. I'm gonna get this pretty wrong, but I might get a few of them right. You can see I got <laughs> these ones right, but all those other ones wrong. And then I could show the solution and it's gonna show me what the correct answers are. As a learner, I could practice this as many times as I wanted before moving on to the next example. You can do things like um, fill in the blanks. So here's a fill in the blank activity where we're practicing pluralization. And I can get real time feedback. I got all of them wrong. Let's see the solutions. I have to fill in all the blanks before I do. So you can give them feedback and instruction there. You can build flashcards. This one is really fun. What's the name of this snail? Oh, it's actually a broadbanded forest snail. I think this is a pink ladies slipper. Yes, I know that one. White flower. Definitely got that one wrong. I think this is a giant puffball, and she's got the Latin name as a hint for me. Yes, okay. So, so you can see you're doing kind of different interactive content. You have a series of flashcards where you're practicing this Barry's name in Spanish. Um, is that right? No, Fresa. Okay, I got it wrong. Uh, and then you could do things like hotspots. So here is an image where I've added a bunch of annotated hotspots. So that's this word, that's this word. A lot of different really interesting things that you can do with H5P to enhance learning. Generally, these are pretty easy to build. There's usually a guide to tell you how to build it and what to do with it. And you're supposed to find the tallest tree. I clicked on this and I identified the hotspot. So um, there's a big range of H5P activities that we've kind of demoed and shown there. Hopefully that's got you thinking about the kinds of learning that you could build into a book, make it more interactive than a print text. Um, and you could do lots of different things with media as well, but that takes a bit longer. Yeah, I think Julie had a question about analytics available uh, availability yeah so Julie there is um, an L we're building a new LTI tool that will include a grade pass back to the learning management system for h5p and that would be that's an additional add-on for Pressbooks which Nebraska does not have right now but they, that's coming available soon and they could decide to purchase it has been a, I, I know that these initial trainings are just kind of like often a lot of information all at once Mm -hmm. um, we did provide a link to a Pressbooks user guide. A lot of times you can get the self-help or the self-paced learning there from that. Um, we put that in the chat earlier, but it's just guide.pressbooks.com. And there are a lot, a lot of chapters there that can help you kind of cover the topics you generally will want. Um, and your network managers will be great resources and they can get premium support from us as needed. So we want to be available. We want to help you succeed. And we're really interested to see what you make. We hope that you do consider open licenses and sharing your work with others. Um, everyone will benefit from the things that you make and share. Uh, education is in many ways sharing, so please am consider I, that. Am I correct that you have YouTube videos also? Oh yeah, we do. Um, there's a set of, there are a lot of videos. Some of them are shorter kind of training style videos and others are like versions of this training or webinars that we do on various topics. Like earlier this week, I did a webinar about how to make uh, an open anthology of public domain material. So if you teach in literature, or history, or political science, or law, or a discipline where your primary texts are in the public domain, you may want to make a replacement for the Norton anthology that's free and open because the 
work is already in the public domain. And so I get like an end-to-end -end demo of how to do that, for example. And if you wanted to watch that, that would be there. Steele, I think we have a question regarding what are the what is the difference between EPUB and EPUB three, which I actually don't have an answer to. Okay, Brian. So basically, there's two specifications for EPUB. EPUB two was the older EPUB specification, and it's the one that's still largely supported by most ebook readers. EPUB three is just the newer version of the EPUB specification. The files will function basically identically, and for stability, we would generally recommend making the e the the older EPUB format because more readers will support it more reliably. So it's um, one of the supported formats, EPUB is really EPUB 2. Exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for taking uh, 80 minutes out of your day on a, what promises to be a beautiful spring day all across the, the Midwest. It may be a little hot for you, Amy, but it's nice for us in Wisconsin and probably hopefully nice for you in Nebraska. Um, we really do appreciate your time and attention and we'll cut the recording here and we'll share it with uh, your network manager soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you.